So Colossians 1, verses 24 to chapter 2, verse 5. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone, with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And to this end I labour, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all those who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. I don't know, I've always refused having one of those DNA tests, you know, where you can find out all your ancestry and so forth. And one of the reasons why, or the primary reason, is simply I don't trust the big corporations. You know, I personally don't trust them what to do with that sort of information because, you know, they'll just set it on for insurance purposes and, and so forth. That's just my own, you know, personal opinion. But um, my sister decided to have it done for her son as a Christmas present. And she's just got the results back. And um, the father of her son was um, African from Nigeria. And on that side of it, they've actually traced it back to a, a tribe of slave traders. You know, African slave traders enslaving their own people and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, it's just fascinating to sort of like see how they get this history. And then from the, their own side, um, we're mostly Scandinavian, come from the Vikings. You know, hence the blonde, well, not so more blonde now. Hence, when I was young, blonde hair and blue eyes, we got that DNA. So my ancestors were the Vikings. And so about all the raiding we did a thousand years ago, sorry about that, just on behalf of, uh, you know, my ancestors. But it's absolutely fascinating. There's even 1% Jewish there, apparently, somewhere. You know, and there's also a bit of Saxon as well. So it's amazing about this makeup of, uh, you know, where we come from. But isn't it wonderful? It doesn't matter what our DNA or what our background, our colour or creed is. The gospel of Jesus Christ is literally for every human being on the face of this earth. That God treats us all equally and loves us all the same. And I find Paul's letter here interesting, especially this bit where he talks about his suffering, his toil and struggle. He talks about his commission as God's servant. And he talks about the mystery that he proclaims. And in his struggles... He talks about, in Romans 7, he talks about the inner struggles that he often had at times. The temptations to, and, and the, and the um, emotions which were battling inside of him. And he talks that, about that as a struggle. He says, quite often, these things I want to do. He said, I don't end up doing them. I do the very things I don't want to do because of sin that is working in me. And he talks about, in that wonderful chapter, about how he works it out in the, um, the presence of God. He talks about outer struggles elsewhere. He talks about persecutions, troubles, hardships, sickness of body, etc. And isn't it true that we, as Christians, we all have this. It doesn't matter how mature we become in Christ, how long we've walked with him or how long our journey is. There's still at times when we will have inner struggles and there'll be times when we'll have outer struggles. When our mind or our heart may seem the very enemy against us. And sometimes when just outward circumstances seem to, to crowd in and want to crush us or want to cause our faith to, to crack and to crumble. And I think it's our attitude that gets us through. If we have the right attitude that Paul talks about, I really believe we can go through anything, having that peace and that joy which he mentions. 
because talent is not enough. You only have to watch some of these um, shows, whatever you want, these talent shows, to see that sometimes people can have a great talent, but if they have the wrong attitude, that can actually destroy their talent or cause more problems than they expected. So, like I used to say to people, we had a, a dog once, a border collie. Well, we've got a dog now, but this is a dog in the past. We had a, a border collie called Sam, and he was a bit nutty, I think. And he was a little bit of a, a, a crazy dog, because he had been a working sheepdog, and he developed a habit of biting the ears of the sheep. And the farmer said it's actually cheaper to train a dog up from scratch than it is to correct him from... Um, you know, bad habit. He was only two years old and was just about, you know, finishing his training. So uh, I took him on and, uh, you know, I used to do a lot of cycling in those days and even sometimes there was an old railway track near where we lived which had been turned into uh, uh, one of these walks and it was 13 miles to Northampton and 13 miles back and I would take him quite often on the cycle ride and he would be running all the way and I'd get back home absolutely exhausted and then he'd bring his ball up and be wanting to play the ball. <laughs> and I thought, what could I do to, uh, you know, to tire this, this dog out? But um, one day we brought him a, a hat for winter, um, this hat, and he just chewed it up and tore it into to pieces. And somebody said, look at what your dog's done. And I said, well, that's his attitude. <laughs> It's all true apart from the hat, you know, the, apart from the hat part. But, um, you know, attitude is actually so important. That can really get us through the difficult times if we have the right um, attitude. And I'm not talking about a positive attitude that if it's raining outside, we say, oh, I'm going to be positive, it's going to be sunny. No, it's, well, it's raining, let's just deal with it. Let's just deal with the rain or, or, or whatever it is. So Paul talks about these sufferings, these inner and outer turmoils. And then he talks about his commission as God's servant. And ministry basically means service. And all of us are in ministry. We're all children and servants of the head of the church, who is Christ. We all have different gifts. You have gifts, I don't have. And some of the things you do for the church, I could not do them. I don't have those gifts. That's not how God has um, you know, put me together. There's things that I may do that you may feel right, I couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't stand up in front of people or, or speak or whatever. We all have different gifts, but God calls us all to ministry, all to service. And ministry in sort of like the sense of having the title reverend or ordained or whatever, that's just being set apart for a specific task, etc. But it's so important to remember that all of us are in ministry and we need to have a positive attitude as we seek to fulfil the ministry of Christ. Paul's gift was apostolic ministry, and it wasn't a task that he had chosen, that he said it's something that had been chosen for him. And he had not imagined his message, it was revealed to him. This was something that he's talking about here, that it's not something he just imagined. I thought, oh, this is a great message to bring. It was something that was revealed to him by Christ and by the Holy Spirit. Because knowledge comes to us in different ways, but one of the ways is study. There are many books, lessons and so on that can give us insight into many things. But only the word of God can actually show us the way to God and help us understand the ways of God. And then there's revelation where we learn the word and we experience it in our our lives. But Paul uses the word mystery three times, not because the truths of God are confusing and unintelligible, but because he was saying they were undiscoverable by humanity. This was something that was hidden in days past. It doesn't matter how many books you read. It doesn't matter how academically gifted you were. This was knowledge that you could not understand until God came down from heaven in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, and revealed it to us. That's the mystery he's talking about. It's revealed knowledge, revealed by Christ. No amount of study or research could reveal knowledge of the gospel. It was a secret hidden by God until the right time for it to be revealed. And the essential character of Christian truth is that it is a revelation. It's been revealed by God through Christ, through the apostles, and now through the church, because it's hidden no longer. That's what he's saying, that this knowledge is now revealed. It's not hidden. We as the church, you as the church, you can take this great message, this great revelation, and proclaim it and herald it to the world. And I'll just say this, when we talk about... um, 
you know, preaching. In the book of Acts, it talks about preaching the gospel. There's actually two words it uses, which I won't go into this morning. One is herald in the gospel, you know, which is, you know, when somebody stands up in the front and proclaims it. The other is gossiping the gospel. And the New Testament actually uses that word, gossiping the gospel, where, you know, people in the marketplaces and the um, places where people socialise were just gossiping about the gospel and so forth. But he's saying that he was a servant of the gospel to make the word of God fully known and a servant of the church to enable the people to reach maturity in faith. So Paul's primary ministry was to teach and preach the word of God both inside the church and also outside the church through heralding the message and sometimes through gossiping the message. And it's by the truth of the gospel that the Christian church is formed, sustained and equipped I genuinely believe, as do many other Christians, that without the ministry of the word, churches wither and die, or they become what they are not supposed to be, an enfeebled church. I think the ministry of the word, myself as the minister, it's a great privilege and responsibility to be able to stand up and speak to people about this mystery that God has revealed. And I do believe, as a minister, that the ministry of preaching is actually very important. It's core and fundamental to the, to the health of any church. It was the primary ministry that sustains all others. No other ministry can exist in isolation from the word or it becomes fruitless and meaningless. For example, as we celebrate or remember the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, in the 16th century the reformers rediscovered the significance and the power of the word of God. They looked at all the rituals and all of the add-ons that had been added to the word, and they said, my goodness, the word actually says we don't need to be doing all of these things. And they wanted to get back back to the basics of the primacy of the word. And we know our history, it changed Europe. The the Protestant uh, free church was born, and it's taken many forms, of course, in, in history since then. But Paul's aim was to dispense the word so that everybody could be led towards a place of spiritual maturity. I'll say this, that a church is not a church unless it sees itself as entrusted with the ministry of the word, entrusted with the revelation of God. We are not some pitiable relic attempting to justify our existence or to hold on to irrelevant messages of a bygone age. The Gospels and the Scriptures, as relevant today as yesterday, tell us that we are a ministry, we are in service to others, and we exist to serve Christ and to make him known. And that's what Paul was saying was his great aim, and I think that should be our great aim, to preach the fullest gospel possible. So I just want to remind us as the church this morning, we we have a message. We don't need to invent it, it's been revealed to us. We need to study it, we need to understand it, we need to come to maturity so that we can understand what Christ has done for us. And we all have a ministry which ultimately is to proclaim this gospel through heralding it and through gospel it, um, gossiping it. To heal the hurts of the wounded, to quell the anxieties of the fearful, to meet the needs of the impoverished, to celebrate the achievements of the accomplished, and to see the vision of God and who he causes people to be fulfilled. So I want to say this as I come almost to the third point, that... Um, We should never retreat into the smallness of which we imagine ourselves to be. Sometimes we can look around and we can see empty pews or we can see issues or things we um, we have to face. But let us allow our whole thought processes, our whole attitude to be changed to understand who God says we are and the power there is in his message. Because the twofold proclamation that Paul talks about, he says, Christ in you and the hope of glory. And that's the message, Christ is in us, and we, each and every one of us, have the hope of glory. Christ in you means an inner turning of the heart towards God. And though inner struggles will still be there, it's learning what it means to serve God and pressing on through those times. It's a journey towards wholeness. I was thinking this morning, I don't know why, but my thoughts just turned back to my own conversion to Christ. And it happened in a relatively short period of time. And I just remember, and it was one night where I absolutely made the decision and my life was turned around, but I just 
thinking about it this morning that before that happened, I was so disinterested in the things of God. If people said, oh, one day you'll be studying, studying theology, I would have swore them probably. <laughs> they said that will never happen. I just was not interested in the things of God. But my mother and father were praying for me. Other people were praying for me, and God was interested in me, the same as you. And suddenly that revelation, that mystery started to chip away at me. It started to work, it started to get into my head, started to get into my heart. And then one day, as the, um, John Newton says in the great hymn, it was like all of a sudden the um, shield was lifted away and I could suddenly see this makes sense. I understand who Christ is and committed my life to him. And since then, it's been terrible inner struggles at times, terrible outward struggles and challenges to overcome, but also wonderful experiences and so forth. It's been a journey where God sometimes has had to pull me along, sometimes had to drag me along, sometimes had to push me along, sometimes had to try to hold me back when I'm trying to go miles ahead of what the Holy Spirit wants. And it's learning to actually walk step by step with God, where he wants us to be, doing what he calls us to do, where actually Christ in us suddenly makes sense and we understand that we are a part of something incredible. And that gives us the hope of glory. So the hope of glory, i finish with this, is that life really does go on forever. Isn't it wonderful when I say that our physical form will die? We know that, but our spirit will never die. That's something we see in the scriptures. There's a lot about death we do not understand. And at times it can be a sobering thought to be faced with our own mortality. But if we refuse to contemplate our mortality. We refuse to contemplate the reality of our lives. One of the spiritual development courses I used to do when I was in the military I used to to lead would be to take young people on the ages of 16 up to 36 but mostly around the age of 18 to 20 before they were being sent to a war zone to sit down and one of the topics we was asked to teach, teach them about their mortality. They need to write a will because you need to say to them that there are the chances when you go into this war zone that you may be killed. You know, this is the reality. This is what uh, you've signed up for, so to speak. I know the President of America has been criticised for saying those words this week, but it's true. They do need to know what they sign up for. You know, they have signed up. They are aware they're going into dangerous you know, situations and so forth. And so one of the things we would do would be to say, have you ever thought about your own mortality and what do you think there might be after death and so forth and we used to have wonderful conversations you know with these uh, you know with these people but if we refuse to contemplate the reality of our lives we can miss out on what is truly important and also we will not value time as much as we could we won't appreciate different experiences to the depth we can but actually when we understand the gospel in all its fullness and realize that life really does go on forever there's the hope of glory that's when Paul can say death where's your sting it's gone the sting which will cripple people with pain and uh, humiliation and fear and so forth he said that's gone because we understand that life does go on forever even though we lose our physical form at some point to regain it a future resurrection which I won't go into this morning so we are not our body and the death of it is not the death of us That's what Paul talks about. And death is a door opening, not a door closing. And that's why Paul says, we are in this world, but not of it. So I want to say in closing, let us glorify and celebrate who we are today. Do not condemn who we were yesterday or what we were, and do not preclude what we will become tomorrow. Because the beauty of the thing is, is that despite our inner and outer strugglings, Each and every one of us have been commissioned as God's children and his servants. We've all got Christ in us and we have the hope of glory. And this is the mystery that we explain, the mystery that once was hidden but now is fully known. And we as Christians have the wonderful privilege and the wonderful responsibility of, to the best of our ability, of just seeking to bear witness to the truth that Christ has given to the church. Let us pray. Lord, so many times we see the 
we can see the, the responsibilities of, of church as a burden, as a challenge. Help us, Lord, to have the attitude where we will always see it as a privilege to be something part of what you are seeking to do in the earth. Lord, we realise that unless Christ builds the church, we who labour, labour in vain. So Lord, we do not want to do the work for you. We, want you to, we don't want you to do the work for us. We want to do it with you as partners in fellowship with your Holy Spirit. So Lord, help us to recognise the wonderful privilege of all of us being in ministry to your church and serving Christ, who is the hope of glory. In your name, Amen. Just say this in uh, closing, because it occurred to me just during the, the prayer there. Paul mentions about the Laodiceans there, and that was the, I think that was the church where he says that um, he said Christ is knocking on the door to come in. And sometimes that's used as an evangelistic sermon, but actually that was something he was saying to the church, that the church had actually shut him out. And he was knocking, saying, can I come back in and be the head of the church, be the lord of the church, be who you want me to be, that you may become who I have called you to be. Okay, we're going to sing our final...